Hello, thanks for joining me today to learn more about human trafficking, which I know is a really tough topic to talk about, but I'm thankful that you're here today to learn a little bit more about it. And I'm going to run through a lot of information pretty quickly, but I'm hoping that at the end of our talk today, you will understand a little bit more what human trafficking is, how it's happening in San Diego, and what we can do about it. So first, let's start by defining human trafficking. Uh, so we are probably most familiar with human trafficking when we think of prostitution. And we'll talk a little bit more about the differences. But human trafficking is the expo exploitation of another per person for the purposes of commercial sex or labor. And the key factors that have to be in place for something to be human trafficking are either force, fraud, or coercion. We'll talk more about what that means because it's not what we often think of in the media when we think of somebody being forced uh, into human trafficking. Also, for under the definition of human trafficking, if somebody is a minor, so if they're under age, the age of 18, any commercial sex act is considered human trafficking. So you cannot be a child prostitute under the law because of the human trafficking laws. And there are three types of human trafficking we're going to talk about today. The one that people are most familiar with is sex trafficking, but there's also labor trafficking and organ trafficking, and we'll be going over some of the details. So let's uh, start by talking about the commercial sexual exploitation of children, otherwise called CSEC. So commercial exploitation of children happens in a variety of ways. It can happen when a child is trafficked, so, so somebody who is a minor under the, the age of 18, or um, in the case of child pornography, child sex tourism, and child marriage. All of those come under the umbrella of CSEC. And California is actually a magnet for CSEC. It, um, the FBI noted San Diego as a hotspot for the commercial sexual exploitation of children. San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego are hotspots. Now that is primarily because we are an urban area with a high population. We'll talk more about why San Diego happens to be a hotspot in a minute, but we do know that the FBI does identify three of the hotspots in our nation right here in the state of California. This is the Polaris heat map. And the Polaris heat map is a good way to illustrate what's happening in our nation. So these uh, colors represent calls that are coming into the a national human trafficking hotline. And you'll see the red areas are the most highly concentrated areas where they're getting calls that somebody is concerned about trafficking happening. And what you'll notice is, much like the population of our country, it is concentrated on the coast. But you can see through this map that we've got trafficking going on all over the country. But why San Diego? So most often I hear people say that they think trafficking is happening in San Diego because we're a border town. So we live in a bi-national community with uh, Mexico just minutes away from us right here where I'm standing. And while peop most people think that <clears throat> is the primary reason why we are a hotspot for trafficking, it's actually not the case. So the reason why San Diego is a hotspot is because of demand. So we are a, uh, an urban area with a high population, but we also have some special categories within our population that, that lead to higher demand. And one of them is the tourism and convention business. So anytime you have large conventions, large sporting events coming into a city, you're going to see an increase in trafficking because who's coming in for those events? unfortunately, um, buyers are coming. And so we know that because we are a tourist destination and a convention destination, that we see higher rates of trafficking. In addition, uh, we have a high military presence. We have military bases here in San Diego. And the military is a major driver of demand around human trafficking. So the buyers are um, many times our military members. And so being a military town is going to uptick the human trafficking cases. We also know that there's some good, um, good, not good, but 
the gangs are coordinating um, around trafficking, which is interesting because it's a new dynamic where typically competitive games are gangs are actually now showing evidence of coordinating their work in order to be more organized and be more profitable around the trafficking of people. And then finally, with labor trafficking, you see uh, a high number of labor trafficking cases in San Diego because of our agricultural and hospitality industries. So being a tourist town, being a convention town, means lots of hotels. And we see labor trafficking happening in our hospitality industry, also in our fields, in our agriculture, and in construction. Those are the top three areas that you see labor trafficking. So all of that put together is what makes San Diego a hotspot, not because we're on the border. In fact, what we know is that we actually export our demand to the other side of the border. So just on the other side, of the Mexican uh, United States border is the city of Tijuana and an area called Zona Norte or the red light district. And that is primarily um, filled with and populated by buyers that are coming over the border. I was just talking to someone yesterday who spent some time in Zona Norte a couple of weekends ago and told me that sadly it's business as usual. So what you've got going on there are buyers that are, no matter what we're hearing, the border is open. Um, buyers are able to come, uh, go across the border into Tijuana, buy commercial sex, and then come back into the United States with no repercussions or consequences at all. So the red light district in, in Tijuana continues to thrive because of the basically the exportation of demand into that region. So um, in my opinion, we've got a bigger problem with what we're doing to our, our neighboring country than what they're um, importing to us. It's much more uncommon to see somebody trafficked across the border into the United States, although that does happen. So I'm going to just stop with a little start here with a little uh, news clip of a news story just to uh, highlight this idea of trafficking that's happening in our region. So this news story is um, from a couple of years ago, but we have had some different stings um, or operations in our region where law enforcement has gotten involved and been able to capture a ring of people who are trafficking a group of victims, and uh, that is really the goal with law enforcement is to get to the high level, which are the people that are trafficking others and not just uh, the, the victims of trafficking that are often um, misconstrued as prostitutes or people that are choosing that or even just going after the buyers, but actually trying to get to the source of the traffickers. So let's look at this news clip. San Diego police arrested two men they say were running a covert and very sophisticated online prostitution ring. New at 6, 10 News anchor Vanessa Van Hefty live with why they say this arrest is groundbreaking. Vanessa. I take it both of these men are in their 60s. One of them lives just up the hill here with his wife in this quiet Tierra Sansa neighborhood. Police say this website was huge with more than 50,000 users. It is the oldest profession in the book with a new trick. Take what was traditional street prostitution and basically bring it indoors. Police say Christian Koalani pimped out women on his Facebook page, even writing a book called The Story of an American Escort, chronicling his expertise as a pimp. His business boomed, though, when he later joined forces with Dale Vinzant who operated an alleged member-only prostitution website. Johns could shop for a call girl, negotiate price, and write a review. People who paid money, you know, to have sex with women could post a review in terms of, you know, how that event unfolded, uh, the money that was exchanged, and, and, and quite frankly, the performance. We knocked on Vinzant's door. His adult daughter denied all charges, telling us what her father does in his downtime is his own business, questioning if we were the moral police. Investigators say both men had sex with the women they were pimping out, luring them with drugs and money. Police say Koalani brought in the girls. Vinzant vetted each paying John, making sure they weren't a snitch. It was very covert. Not a lot of people knew about it, only those really who were, were members. They were making money, um, but, at, but at the expense of women. 
And both men were booked on numerous prostitution-related charges. Police say this website was operational for about 10 years before a user blew the whistle. Okay, so there's actually a couple things about that news clip that I want to point out. Uh, this was from a few years ago. This ring ran for 10 years. And like they said in the story, they estimated about 50,000 clients and, and victim members. But a couple things I want to highlight from this video. First of all, you saw them talking about prostitution. So the reality is that the line between prostitution and human trafficking can be really confusing. But what we know from the research and from our experience is that many of the women and men and youth who are identified as prostitutes are actually being trafficked. They do fit under that definition of being under force, fraud, or coercion. And that force, fraud, or coercion can look a lot of different ways. It doesn't just look like a violent uh, physical force. We'll talk a little bit more about the different types of coercion that are involved with trafficking. But I think it's important to note that our media, this, actually, this story was actually in 2016. And even though it's a bit dated, I thought it was important to show this, to show uh, just some of the, the myth busting that it can do. You've got a uh, very, uh, you know, Tierra Santa, a very uh, family friendly community where this is happening. And also the, the fact that it was happening online. So most of trafficking is now being facilitated online. You may have heard in the media about them shutting down Backpage, uh, which was a great thing, but unfortunately we, we call it whack-a-mole. Basically within the same day of Backpage going down, other sites were popping up all over. So it just moved onto other places. But those who are buying sex know how to find it. And that has not changed really with the shutdown of Backpage. So uh, what we're seeing is this real shift from the risk that was involved years ago where you had to go uh, drive down El Cajon Boulevard or several of the other places in town that we call the Blade, which are places where uh, human trafficking victims uh, would be or people who are being prostituted would be out physically out waiting to get propositioned or picked up by a buyer. And you don't see that much anymore. There's a little bit of that going on. But what we found is that when that's happening now, it's happening as a result of some form of punishment. So you're talking about the very lowest, most desperate people who are out on the blade, either because their pimp is punishing them for not hitting their quota, or um, there could be other circumstances where they're in a, a more uh, desperate uh, situation where they're out on the blade. But primarily most of the actual appointment setting and the, the transaction of trafficking is happening through online formats. So this story does point that out. But the other thing I want to point out is something that we've been talking to the media about, which is the way we represent this kind of a story. So typical to 2016, you see every story that really is about human trafficking talking about prostitution. And you also see media images all the time, B-roll images of women with handcuffs on, scantily clad. So we're perpetuating some of those myths even in the media by the way the story's been covered. And that's been something that we have been working really hard on in the work to help educate the media. And I'll show you a, a trailer a little bit later for a program that's a really wonderful departure from that um, perpetuation of those, those um misconceptions about trafficking. Okay, so gonna jump on to organ trafficking just really quickly. We cannot possibly in this short of a time cover all the details, but um, we do know that organ trafficking is actually a reality. It's definitely much more publicized in countries outside of the United States, but we do have a realization even in the United States that we don't always know how to track our supply chain for organs. And so what we're seeing for sure uh, in other parts of the country is that um, organ trafficking is alive and well, which is the illegal harvesting of human organs for the purpose of transplantation. You may have heard stories in the media, some of these crazy stories where, um, I mean, there's unfortunately even conspiracy theories about this, but the reality is there are families who sometimes out of really uh, dire straits are selling organs of family members uh, in order to make money and there, is, there are trafficking rings involved. So whenever you see an ability for profit and you have a demand, the combination of the two is where you see the exploitation. So uh, organ trafficking is something that we hope is going to continue to get more and more uh, coverage and attention in the United States, but something just to put on your radar that is a part of the human trafficking problem. 
Labor trafficking is something that isn't as commonly talked about, but um, I have some feelings on why this happens. And I think part of it is I think labor trafficking hits a lot closer to home. Most of us can create kind of a, a safe distance between us and sex trafficking and and like to believe that it's, it's not... Um, in our, in our world and in our community, which isn't true, but it's easier to do that. With labor trafficking, we're literally talking about the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, the services that we experience. Uh, there is trafficking tied to all of those. And so what they believe through research is that it's about an eight to one ratio. So for every person that is human, that's uh, a victim of sex trafficking in San Diego, we believe there are probably eight victims of labor trafficking. So there was a really important study done out of SDSU uh, that estimated about 40,000 undocumented workers in the United States, in San Diego, had experienced labor trafficking. And what we found in that research is that most of those people actually entered the United States legally. So they entered legally on a temporary work visa and then were oftentimes recruited into a situation where they started to be exploited. And one of the things we see with labor trafficking exploiters is that they will actually hold documentation and paperwork of their people in order to create that, that coercion. And so the, the person who's being exploited doesn't even feel the freedom or know how to get help. Uh, so we see that going on in, um, in different sectors, and we'll talk a little bit about where we see it in San Diego. Um, so here are some of the places where we see victims of labor trafficking, not all inclusive, but we know that the International Labor Organization estimates that there are about 21 million victims around the world of forced labor. And uh, it's about a $150 billion annual industry worldwide. And I think that the error that we make is that we think it's happening over there. Um, and I know that that was me 10 years ago, not understanding how much trafficking is actually happening in our region. But we know that both um, labor and sex trafficking have been identified in San Diego. But we... Um, we have the study that I mentioned that talks about the, the number of victims of labor trafficking, but we see it all across sectors. So we see it in construction. We see it in hospitality and janitorial services. Now, this doesn't mean that the major hotel chain uh, is necessarily trafficking their, their janitorial staff, but what we'll see is oftentimes these larger businesses will subcontract out services like janitorial and it will be that smaller contractor that's involved in the trafficking. And again, it can look a lot of different ways. It can be where someone is being paid but not being paid a fair rate. It can be where somebody doesn't have the freedom of movement, where they can um, they might be um, being held or living somewhere where they may not um, be think of themselves as being held, but they really don't have the, the freedom of movement. And especially if they're from out of the country and they were recruited here to work and then are being exploited, oftentimes they don't have the frame of reference to even understand the exploitation they're under. And they certainly don't have the trust in the system to know how and when to get help. For example, one way that we see that happening a lot in San Diego is through the massage establishment. So we have a lot of illicit massage establishments in town, and they are housing sometimes in the establishment the women who are being forced to uh, offer serv uh, commercial sex services. And these women are recruited from other countries, brought here, their papers are held. There's all kinds of cultural and language barriers that then put them in a situation where they don't feel there's any way out. And it's even more complicated than helping them know there's a way out because oftentimes you've got pressures on them that we can't even understand where they were brought here to make money to send back to their family. And even if they don't uh, like what they're doing or want to be doing it, they feel that pressure to, to be supporting their family overseas. So the complexity of labor trafficking um, can be really, really complicated because of all of those other factors. But these are just uh, some of the places that, that we see it happening here in town. So who's vulnerable? Well, first of all, like this study showed, we see a real correlation between people who come here legally to work on temporary visas and then are exploited or recruited into trafficking. And we do see that the influx of labor trafficking victims coming from outside of the country. But we also see it happening with people who have uh, who are 
um, not immigrants or refugees who are citizens who are still um, possibly ethnic minorities or victims of poverty and they have other barriers where they're more vulnerable and susceptible to being exploited in order to earn an income and support their family. So let's jump to sex trafficking. I am, I know I'm going fast here, but wanting to give you as, as much of an overview as I can. So Poilam and Nazarene University was involved in a research study with the University of San Diego, and the results came out in 2016. This study was funded by the Department of Justice, and it was the first time any ma uh, major metropolitan area was looked at to determine how many victims of sex trafficking are there in a region, who are they, where are they coming from, how old are they, and then also looking at the amount of the size of the economy. So if you pay attention at all to San Diego human trafficking news, you've seen these statistics uh, that we know that we have up to 8,000 victims at any given time in our region who are being exploited through the commercial sex industry. And we have found that the average age in San Diego of entry is 16. And when you, uh, if you know anything about averages, you know that that means that there are people on all sides of that age. So there are younger victims and there are older victims. And I know that in the work that we've done with our scholarship here at the university, we have had um, students here who are survivors of trafficking that have ra um, ranged in age from 21 to uh, late 40s. So we've, we've personally experienced that, that rage of age too. We also know that, again, back to my earlier point, that our, our sex trafficking issue here in San Diego is not because we're bringing a bunch of people uh, over into our country from other countries, but in fact, 80% of our victims are born here. They are citizens. Uh, and it's, it's a, a part of an $810 million underground illicit sex economy in our region. So it is big money. And like I mentioned earlier, again, when you bring the, the when you meet the demand to the profitability, you have the perfect storm for exploitation. We know that a typical trafficker is going to probably run three or four women in their uh, in their business, and they can make upwards of six hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year off of three or four women. So it is um, very profitable, uh, much less risky than other kinds of trafficking, like drug trafficking or weapons trafficking, where the criminal consequences are very severe for those two. With human trafficking, you see um, very short sentences of the. The federal prosecutions that happened in our region over the last few years, the average term of a prison term, a federal prison term for a trafficker who was involved in major prostitution rings, trafficking rings, it was about four years. So, uh, and people know that. Uh, traffickers know that it's a lot less risky to traffic a person than it is to traffic, for example, in drugs. And your supply is easier to access. So people ask me if somebody gets out of the life, leaves the life, is, is helped out? Are they at risk of being found by their pimp and brought back into the life? And while we know that does happen, what we also know is that to the pimp, that woman or person is, is pretty dispendable um, because they, disposable, they, because they can uh, find another one so easily. And so the supply is it is not difficult for these traffickers, unfortunately, because they're so sophisticated in knowing how to prey on people. And so therefore, it's, it's, it's an easier business model, unfortunately, uh, both for profitability and for consequences. So I'm going to show you a trailer from a new program that was just put out by NBC7 San Diego, which I highly recommend. It's a seven-part series. They're about 15 minutes apiece. And this... Um, it does a very good job of talking about trafficking in general and all the different layers of it, how it's happening in San Diego. Very well done by uh, news anchor Monica Dean, who spent a year on an underground investigative report study to see what was really happening in San Diego. So I'm going to show you this trailer now. Trafficking. It's a problem that is widely misunderstood. It's happening in nearly all of our schools and exploiting our kids. 
Your child does not have to leave their room to be exploited. It's our neighbors trafficking our neighbors. It's our middle schoolers trafficking our middle schoolers. I'm a journalist, but I'm also a mother. Every parent and anyone with a child in their life needs to understand this issue and see what we found happening across San Diego. How old was she when she met this man? 17. Yeah, she was 17 years old. Who's actually protecting our children? This is difficult. It's uncomfortable, but it's happening all around us. I wouldn't have known it was her if I didn't see it on her iPad. What we uncovered was eye-opening, from how this happens to holes in our legal system. He got a get-out-of-jail-free card. It is a battle and a half. It is a battle and a half. But there is hope. I'm not going to quit. I'm not giving up on my daughter. That darkness is really, really great, but the light is greater. It's so much greater. Fighting to take back what was stolen. Okay, so I would really recommend that you take the time to watch that. Again, you can watch it on your own. It's at NBC7.com slash stolen, and it's broken down into seven parts. She talks to almost all of the leaders in our region who are doing work to fight sex trafficking, and she goes undercover. She looks at a particular case where she gets to talk actually to both the trafficker and the buyer, and uh, it really is an enlightening uh, series to, to get, to go deeper and learn more. But, um, back to what I was talking about. So this is a picture that's important. And when we talk about who is most vulnerable, we, although vulnerability does go across ages, what we find is the runaway in San Diego is particularly vulnerable. And we specifically call out the 15 year old runaway because a 15 year old can't even get a job permit. So you've got a kid that has run away on the streets of San Diego, and we know that within about 48 hours, they're going to be approached by a trafficker. So they are very, very at risk. Anytime I'm aware of a runaway, it's the first place my mind goes now, because we know that uh, traffickers are on the lookout for kids who are running away. And the important thing to know, too, is that our kids who are exploited through sex trafficking are um, both genders, all genders. They are also all races. They are not just poor kids. They're kids that come from all over. Um, trafficking, unfortunately, um, can hit anybody. And we know that in particular, kids who have vulnerabilities like low self-esteem, who are um, struggling in their relationships, who perhaps don't have a safe family home life or a family home life that is tracking them closely, those kids can be especially vulnerable. We know too that LGBTQ youth are especially vulnerable to being trafficked. Again, the traffickers know how to exploit vulnerability. So there are lots of different things that make a person or a youth vulnerable and traffickers know exactly how to use those uh, to lure the kids in. This particular map is important because it shows uh, in the research study that I mentioned earlier, we interviewed and we, we had data from over 200 uh, women who had been arrested for prostitution who then identified as, uh, through our screening process, were identified as actually being trafficked. So um, right now in San Diego, if you are arrested for prostitution, there is a, a, a screening process that goes that happens that helps us identify if that woman is in fact a victim of trafficking, uh, and whether or not they're a victim of trafficking or it is determined to be prostitution, they're now given the opportunity to go into a program to learn more and and to avoid the criminal justice system. So we're making some progress there, but this map shows that uh, where the victims lived, so not where the trafficking occurred, but actually where the victims lived, and you can see in the the ones that we talked to that they're spread all over. Again, to illustrate that this is not just a certain area of town where this is happening, but it's really happening everywhere. So um, these are signs that we can look for, warning signs. Now, you could look at these warning signs and they could mean a lot of things. So I don't want you to walk away and think that 
if you know somebody with a couple of these warning signs that they must be trafficked. But it's important for us to realize that the signs are usually there. So we do a prevention curriculum in the schools called No More. And the whole point of that curriculum is actually to show the progression of a girl who is a 16 year old girl who is on the yearbook staff, has friends, connected in with her teachers, who actually gets groomed and recruited and then ultimately trafficked right under the noses of her mom, her teachers, and her friends who was exhibiting a lot of these warning signs. So things like sudden change in behavior in friend groups, sudden dropping of friends. Um, if, if a kid shows up with clothing that seems really out of place, an expensive purse, uh, jewelry, signs that just don't fit with what you know to be a part of that that kiddo's normal life. Um, we see things happening on social media. A lot of times it's the peers, the friends that know that see what's happening and just don't know what they're looking at. So that's the whole purpose of No More is to teach our youth what it looks like to be recruited so that you can be not a bystander to it, but be an upstander. And then we teach them what to do about it and who to talk to and how to get help. So um, these are some of, but not all of the signs that we will look for that kind of help, we call them red flags that will help us identify that we need to look a little deeper and figure out if something more is going on. Unfortunately, um, this, is, this is actually a group of people who were arrested for trafficking. And one of the things I like to point out about this is the variety that we see here. So if I were to ask you to close your eyes and think of the, what is the first image that comes to your mind when you hear the word pimp? I can pretty much guarantee you what it's going to be. And it's going to be, um, most likely be an African-American male dressed in a certain way. That is how our culture and our media has perpetuated this idea of pimp. But all five of the people on this uh, screen uh, are pimps. So you've even got a woman there. The very first victim that I worked with and mentored was pimped out by another woman. So it started with panhandling. She found this really vulnerable young woman in a very vulnerable situation, brought her into her group got her to panhandle first and then trafficked her in the uh, commercial sex industry in San Diego. And it was done, it was done by a woman. So one of the things that we are very intent on at the university is to talk to people about the fact that our ideas about what a trafficker looks like and, and who they are, are, are incorrect. And that we need to recognize that traffickers can be within your family. Um, they can be older boyfriends who pose as boyfriends, but are actually pimps. And they are, um, we do know that the the African-American, the black community in our region is disproportionately affected both with people who are traffickers and, but also with people who are victimized and who are trafficked. Um, but important for everyone to realize that there is no cookie cutter, what a pimp or a trafficker looks like. There are lots of things that a trafficker, what we call is in their toolbox, things that they're using to uh, create this environment of either force, fraud, or coercion. And with labor trafficking, you'll see this a lot. You'll see debt bondage. So this is very common in the illicit massage industry here in San Diego, where you've got a woman that comes from overseas. She now owes whoever brought her a large amount of money to cover the cost of getting her here, her living expenses. She's racking up debt or debt bondage that she can never pay down. And so the pressure that that creates then will lead, increase the vulnerability that could lead her into a situation where her job moves from legitimate massage to sex acts during massage or illicit massage. Um, we also do see violence and threats. Um, those are... Those are real, but we see more often control that comes through other means. So I want to just focus on the three types of coercion that we saw the most in our research. So, and they, as you can see, none of them are forced. So none of them are the story of the guy kidnapping the little girl and throwing her in the back of a van and sending her to another country and trafficking her. In fact, they're all um, not physical violence. The highest one is psychological. So this coercion and control that happens through this unhealthy, broken, but effective psychological bond where, in fact, what we see a lot going on in San Diego are young girls who look at their trafficker as their boyfriend and legitimately think that that trafficker loves them. Then you see economic coercion. In 47% of the, the victims that we talked to, there was economic coercion where 
the victim actually was um, involved in trafficking under some kind of coercion related to just to paying the bills. So we see that as what we call survival sex in the runaway uh, youth community, where they're doing uh, sex acts in order to get a place to sleep or a meal. And then finally, we see chemical coercion. We know that in working with people coming out of a life of exploitation, that substance abuse is a real issue. And it makes sense to me. Uh, if you are in undergoing that amount of trauma, substance abuse can be a good escape. So we see it on both sides. We see uh, drugs and alcohol being used as a way for a victim to numb out and not experience the pain at such a deep level. And we also see, see it being used as a manipulation tactic on the side of the trafficker. So we see what we call chemical coercion going on um, in almost half of the cases. So just to, um, in closing, this is, if there's anything I wanted you to take away today, it would be this slide. So screenshot it, write down this number, but if everybody could have the National Human Trafficking Hotline on their phone, which is 888-373-7888, that is a good number to have. And I tell people all the time to not hesitate to use it. It's a national number that then gets routed in locally. So when you call in San Diego to report something in San Diego, it's actually going to local people who work in our region. And it's important. Um, if they get multiple tips on certain businesses, that will then compel law enforcement to take a deeper look. So it's never too small uh, to call about. If it's something that doesn't feel right in your gut, you should listen to that and you should call. Uh, they will always take your call. We also tell people, call 911. If you really see someone that you feel is in danger, call 911. I do recommend that you don't intervene. I know how that is. I've been in a couple situations where I felt like this woman was, was most likely in a really dangerous situation and being trafficked. But if you intervene personally, you not only are going to put yourself potentially at danger, but you're actually going to put that victim in danger because most likely she's being watched by her trafficker. So if you see someone alone on the street and, and you have learned this and see, think you see some of these warning signs and you decide to go and talk to them, you could be putting them at risk because they're prob you're probably being observed by their trafficker and then they're going to get in trouble afterwards. So we really recommend that if you see something that feels dangerous or life-threatening, call 911, tell law enforcement what's happening. Otherwise, call the hotline. If you are aware of something going on with a child under 18, please don't hesitate to call the hotline for child abuse because the, Cal the Child Welfare Services of San Diego are very committed to helping identify kids who are at risk of or being trafficked and they have very substantial protocols that they use and we can trust, we can trust them to, to do that work. Uh, in closing, just a couple things that you can do from 10 seconds to diving deep. So 10 seconds would be put that hotline number in your phone, uh, 10, mean, 10 minutes, social, uh, social media awareness. Now with that, I want to give you a little bit of a caution. One of the things we've been seeing recently is this huge uptick in social media awareness around trafficking. You may have noticed it too, if you're on social media, the problem with that is it's tending to perpetuate some myths. So unfortunately, there are some pretty weird conspiracy theories that are now tied in with human trafficking. And what they're doing is they are distracting us from the real issue. And But people who are unknowingly sharing those posts are pushing that information out further and further. So check your sources, just like we're told to do about everything we do on social media. Don't just reshare stuff, but check. But one way you really can raise awareness is when you see things like information coming out of the Center for Justice and Reconciliation or our Churches Against Trafficking group or other organizations in town that are putting on events or doing work, share that, uh, get the word out. If you um, have the opportunity to attend a local event about trafficking to get more informed, that's a great way to get involved. If you want to go on our website, uh, pointloma.edu slash CJR, we have suggestions too for additional suggestions. And then finally going deep. So one of the best pieces of advice I got when I first started this work was to stop and to listen and to learn before I acted and to really take the time to understand the subject matter before I got involved. And I know if you're anything like me, as soon as I learned that trafficking was happening, I wanted to do something. The first time I found out about it was when a little 13-year-old girl was being trafficked in the park right in my neighborhood. And my daughter at the time was 13. So it hit me especially 
uh, deeply to know that there was a little girl, while my little girl was safe, there was a little girl just a half a mile away from me that was being sold every night by her dad, actually, for his drug habit and living out of a park in, in my normal little neighborhood. So, of course, I wanted to do something. I wanted to act. But what I learned in the process was how important it is to get more deeply informed about this issue before we act. There are lots of things you can do. There are lots of organizations you can partner with and help and support. But you need to, to listen and learn first. So that's my biggest recommendation to you is to to get more knowledgeable. We do have a wonderful organization that we uh, run here at the center called Churches Against Trafficking, which is um, the mobilization of people of faith around our region to help churches directly get involved and mobilize the church around this issue. And every church has a different way that they can do that. We have a church that all they do, their job every month is to provide the paper supplies to one of our local residential facilities that's helping women that are getting out of the life. Uh, then you have churches who do a lot of awareness raising. So churchesagainsttrafficking.com is another website that has a lot of great suggestions. So again, thank you so much for joining me today. I am really honored that you took the time to listen and learn a little bit more about trafficking. Join us on our events on our website and please join us in this fight to end trafficking. Thank you.